Welcome back. Today is the first seminar in our fall 2021 core facility seminar series, and we'll be featuring the Genomics Resource Laboratory. I am Lisa Korpieski, the Director of Communications and Marketing here at the Institute for Applied Life Sciences. In today's seminar, we will hear from Ravi Ranjan, the Director of Genomics, he will tell us about the suite of services available to address your high throughput next generation sequencing needs. Our guest speaker is Rosha Padal from 10X Genomics. The title of her talk is Biology at True Resolution, Resolve Biological Complexities with Single Cell and Spatial Solutions. In addition, we'll hear from Jenny Rausch, Assistant Professor in BNB and IELTS, and her title is Introduction to the 10X Visium System and Applications. We hope that with these bi-weekly seminars, you will discover what great, great resources that the centralized UMass Amherst Corp facilities offers to our campus community, the New England region, and beyond. In just a few housekeeping items, the seminar is being recorded as you just heard. All replays of the seminar in this series can be found on our website. I will put a link in the chat. I recommend you set your view mode to speaker. Please stay muted during the talks. And we will save the Q&A till the end of the presentations. And during that time, I welcome you to unmute yourself and ask your question. And now I'd like to introduce you to Andrew, the director of our UMass Amherst Corp facilities. Andrew. Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the first seminar of the fall 2021 core seminar series. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, my name is Andrew Bernard. I'm the director of centralized core facilities here at UMass. Uh, if you've joined us before, you've heard me discuss our state-of-the-art labs, instrumentation, equipment, and most importantly, world-class experts who are helping researchers at UMass and beyond drive discovery and pursue scientific endeavors across all disciplines. These cores are open to anyone from students to senior scientists, regardless of your affiliation, including if you're not at UMass, uh, and we love working with you, so please reach out if you'd like to find out more about what we do. In order to maintain operations at affordable rates, the core facilities receive a significant investment from the university. Uh, but in addition to this funding, the cores are really dependent on proper acknowledgement and publications and in other areas. It's an important metric of success we can share with leadership that enables them to continue obtaining financial support uh, and so they are here and available to continue providing essential services uh, in the most affordable and effective way possible. It also helps our core staff, many who do not conduct their own independent research, uh, to be able to advance their own careers and adds value uh, to them and the overall health of the core facility. You can learn more about authorship guidelines and suggestions on our websites and also via the Association of Biomedical Resource Facilities. I'll share a link in the, in the chat once I, I stop talking, uh, but we really encourage you to make sure you're acknowledging cores and when you do acknowledge the course, let them know that you've done so, so we make sure uh, we can highlight your work as well. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me or any of the facility directors if you have questions or would like to know more about how to work with us or any of our specific capabilities. I'm now gonna turn over to Dr. Ravi Ranjan, Director of the Genomics Resource Lab, who's gonna discuss both his facility as a whole and a new technology that we're able to acquire with funding from Models to Medicine and Bioactive Delivery, two centers that are part of IELTS, who also helped contribute towards making this acquisition. We are grateful for their continued support. Uh, with that, I'll turn it to Ravi. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa, uh, for organizing the first uh, seminar for the fall session. And thanks, Andrew, for the introduction. Um, uh, I'm, we are very happy uh, to have Liz uh, and Rosha from Penex Genomics um, and Jenny from BMB. She's assistant professor uh, to be part of our uh, seminar today. Um, before I jump in what I offer, I just wanted to uh, introduce what Penix um, and Jenny has to offer in the seminar. So we recently acquired the Tenex Genomics Chromium uh, system, and that is used for uh, the single cell uh, analysis. And Rosha will be talking more on that, uh, how to use the system and the important steps for the single cell projects. Um, and the second phase would be from Jenny, uh, she will be moving for elevating the single cell to a next level that is using the Visium technology. And that includes uh, microscoping of the slides and as well as followed by the genomics. So it is a little bit um, advanced on the single cell side. So we're happy to have that uh, the next uh, from the single cell moving forward to the next uh, technology. So uh, we are located in, uh, the genomics resource lab is located in uh, Morel 1, N330. Um, so, you know, it is uh, far away from Life Sciences Lab. Um, uh, we primarily focus, sorry about that. So we primarily focus on uh, next-gen sequencing uh, projects. Uh, we provide end-to-end uh, -end solutions um, that could be for 
RNA-DNA and isolations, uh, quality assessment, uh, library prep, uh, sequencing, as well as the QPCR assays. Uh, we also take on custom projects. Um, those are not standard services. We work with the investigator to see if we can offer those services as well. We also help them uh, with um, uh, data analysis, uh, publications, grants. So we try to involve uh, wherever as we can for the projects. So, uh, with that, I would like to invite Rosha uh, to take over uh, uh, the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ravi, Lisa, and Andrew. If you could uh, stop sharing your screen, I can go ahead yeah. and share mine. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Great, right, thank you for having us here today. Before I get started, I do want to acknowledge that my colleague uh, Liz Rulo is also on the call. She's the sales executive for UMass Amherst. And we're very excited that Ravi has acquired a Chromium controller. And what I want to really do here today is give you an idea about just basics of why single cell technology is important and what kinds of things people are doing with the 10x uh, solution, single cell solutions that are available. And we'll also give a quick little primer on our Visium spatial technology because Jenny will be presenting a little bit of her exciting work there. So I'm excited to hear about that as well. So this is a very, uh, a little, a pretty old example at this point, I would say, but I really like this example to start thinking about why single cell technologies and why single cell is important in general. So. Uh, we call it the smoothie analogy. So if you were to have a smoothie, the analogy being this is your sample, you put it in a blender and you mix everything together, what you get with bulk analysis is going to be a smoothie. So let's say maybe you have some, um, there's overabundance of strawberries, perhaps you like strawberries, so that's the kind of flavor you're getting. And it's masking everything else that might be available in there. But what single cell technologies let you do is you can now start looking into not just what is present in that heterogeneous mixture, but you can also see what proportion these different items are present in that mixture. So that's kind of where 10x genomic technologies initially began is we were in the single cell space. So your conventional gene expression is of course, uh, if we look at the data on what we call a T-SNEP plot, if you look at an average uh, gene expression in that heterogeneous mixture, you're getting an average single data point. Versus what our chromium system that Ravi has acquired lets you do is look at your heterogeneous sample and look into all of these individual cells and these different clusters of cells. So cells that are transcriptionally similar will be clustered together. So now you can just take your heterogeneous mixture and look at the diversity of the different cell types and identify rare cell types with the single cell system. As well as the next step of moving forward from performing single cell analysis is the spatial aspect of things. So if you're working with, uh, for example, solid tissues, you want to know where spatially these cells are located to, next, uh, located to each other, what functionalities there might be, um, affecting by proximity of being to, uh, next to each other, that's the Visium uh, spatial transcriptomics technology. So my focus today is going to be on the Chromium system. There are a lot of different solutions you can run on the Chromium system. So I will be briefly describing um, some of the very popular solutions. So one of the most popular solutions, I would say at this point is the single cell gene expression or single cell RNA-seq. So this is um, what we call our innovation engine. Um, we listen to their research community quite a bit and ask researchers questions. Hey, what's, what's the next tool you need to answer specific questions in your research or what's, what tool would help advance certain um, aspects of the way research is done right now? And we take that feedback and uh, provide solutions that would be helpful helpful for you. So single cell RNA-seq has been around for quite a while now. We also have, uh, we also heard from researchers about wanting to perform single cell epigenetic, epigenetic analysis. So we introduced single cell um, ATAC sequencing. 
So similarly, and I'll also uh, touch a little bit upon what the field is moving towards slowly is what we call field of multiomics, where you are looking at not just one analyte from a cell, but multiple analytes. So for example, uh, gene expression with RNA-seq, as well as expression of certain cell surface protein markers. So almost like combining flow cytometry with gene expression from the same cell, which we call our feature barcode technology. So there's a lot you can do on that single um, instrument. And the difference really is the workflow is very similar for regardless of what single cell uh, solution that you pick or you decide to do. It usually starts with a user supplied sample. So this could be cells or nuclei. And depending on what uh, biochemistry and reagent you pick, you either have to go with cells or nuclei, for example, for epigenetic analysis. And what you get out of the uh, library creation step is going to be a library that's going to be ready to be sequenced on an Illumina sequencer. So everything that's necessary to generate your sequencing library is part of the 10X consumable pack. So you don't have to have separate reagents to generate the sequencing library. And once you sequence your libraries, we also have software uh, data analysis pipelines available. So for analyzing the data from your FASTQ files, which includes alignment, QC, et cetera, as well as a visualization software. And all of this is available to the research community at no cost. And we also have cloud analysis available to you. And I'll touch on that in a little bit as well. So what's happening, how we enable this uh, single cell, different types of single cell products is on the instrument, the chromium controller, there are two aspects that I think of usually how we're enabling this. So one is of course the instrument, the instrument has a little chip that goes on the instrument. So that's the microfluidics platform. So it's based on microfluidics. And the other aspect of that is this 10X barcoded gel bead. So the idea is, we have these uniquely barcoded gel beads that go into the chip that goes into the 10X instrument. And you're generating these little droplets or nano nanoliter sized reaction chambers where the goal is to capture a gel bead with a single cell or a nuclei. And within those droplets, now you can perform any acid, uh, bio, acid type specific biochemistry. And once everything is barcoded within those droplets, now you can collect them and pull them as a bulk reaction and proceed with library generation. So if we think of a cell and all the different analytes that we look at traditionally, uh, for example, we look at DNA's, uh, DNA's one hypersensitivity sequencing for chromatin accessibility. We also, of course, look at gene expression, either microarrays or bulk RNA-seq. So when I think about what we're doing in the single cell context is 10X solutions are enabling you to look at each of these individual analytes within a single cell or a combination of these analytes. And that's where the feature barcode technology comes in. So like I mentioned earlier, one of the popular ones of course is looking at gene expression as well as cell surface protein combined because now having two types of data coming from the same cell is a lot more robust in um, identifying certain rare cell types, as well as gives you um, two layers of information that you can use to make more impactful biological insights. So going through our single cell RNA sequencing solution, which is pretty popular, a lot of people use and start their single cell um, adventures using the single cell RNA seq solution. How this works is, so this is what a chip looks like that goes into the 10X instrument. And again, of course, we have the barcoded primer library. So once you load your samples into the sample well and load the barcoded primer library into the chip, which then goes into the instrument, you generate these droplets. So because this is RNA-seq, in these droplets, we perform reverse transcription. So uh, once we perform reverse transcription, for example, each of these um, gel beads and the cells that we've now captured will be barcoded with that particular oligo from this unique gel bead. So at this point, after reverse transcription, when you generate first strand cDNA, these are barcoded. So after that, you just pull it together. And if you've um, performed true seq like library prep for Illumina sequencing, uh, other standard type of Illumina sequencing libraries, then it's pretty standard from here on where you just perform fragmentation, PCR, adapter ligation, et cetera, to generate 
a final sequencing library. The runtime on this instrument for generating these droplets is about 18 minutes, and you can run anywhere from a single sample up to eight samples in parallel on a single chip. So going back to what kind of uh, things people do with 10x technology. So this is uh, an older example where we initially profiled, for example, we'll take PBM seeds, which is a mixture of different types of cells. And if we were to look at for example, CD45 expression, you were using bulk analysis, you're getting one particular average number or data point for CD45. But you can take the same heterogeneous mixture of samples and perform single cell RNA sequencing. And now you see all different clusters of cells. These of course have, um, for example, the monocytes have a little um, distinct gene expression pattern than what the uh, T cells would or the cytotoxic T cells are a little bit different from memory T cells. So you can start really getting down and into the nitty gritty of the differences between these different cell types. And I, what I usually also find very remarkable is when you're performing single cell analysis, um, even if there are very uh, rare cells, cells that are expressed in very low frequencies, you're still able to capture those. And that I'm showing you here with uh, this arrow and this little very small brown cluster that is listed as mega cardiocytes. So these are usually about somewhere between 0.1 to 0.5% of the total PDMC population are these cells. And even in, so if we were to do bulk RNA sequencing, of course, we would not pick out any signatures from very rare cell types, but you can still identify very rare cell types using single cell technologies and just from performing um, one experiment. So going into a little bit of the technology itself about how we enable barcoding. Um, if we were to zoom into one of these high di diversity gel bead pools, so of course here um, we're showing different colors mean different unique barcodes. If we zoom in, I think of these gel beads as a hydrogel bid or like a water balloon. So there's a lot of oligos inside of these water balloons. And if we look at into what kind of what the uh, construction of these oligonucleotides is, is the first one up top here, you'll notice all of these have this read one. So this is going to be a primer binding site as well as um, sequencing primer binding site and a PCR handle for when we're sequencing the library. And then we have this 10X barcode. So this is a 16 base pair unique barcode. All the oligonucleotides that come from this particular gel bead will have the same 10X barcode. Then we have this unique molecular identifier or UMI. Uh, because there is a few amplification steps, you can have amplification biases. So to get rid of duplicates, we use the UMIs. And we have the poly DT. So we're priming off of um, mRNA species that have poly A's or poly A tails, so mostly mRNAs, to capture the transcriptome. In addition to the poly DT, primer, we also have what you will notice here, what we're calling capture sequence one and capture sequence two. So this is what we call our feature barcode technology. And the idea here is that if you can conjugate any feature of interest, so for example here where our feature of interest is cell surface protein. So if I can conjugate an antibody with an oligonucleotide that has their capture sequence that's going to be reverse complementary to the capture sequence here, I can then during reverse transcription also generate a separate library that captures these oligos. So that's what the feature barcode technology is. So we've applied it to cell surface protein, we have applied it to antigen specificity, we've applied it to CRISPR single cell CRISPR screens. So the idea is as long as you can have a molecule that you can conjugate an oligonucleotide, you can use this as a proxy of capturing the expression of the cell surface protein for here example. And this correlates pretty nicely with what uh, we would think of flow cytometry. So you're using different fluorophores to look at different types of proteins that have different fluorophores. But of course with flow cytometry, after a certain point, the fluorophores will start overlapping their spectral overlap. So you really only have about 15 to 20 parameters that can be very distinct. Um, going another almost a magnitude further would be cytop, and because these are distinct mass isotopes, they're 
the spectral overlap is not going to be as much because we're looking at different um, isotopes, but still there it's about 100, 100 parameters. But with feature barcode, because this feature barcode is just a 15 base pair distinct nucleotide sequence, we have a lot of opportunities in generating unique sequences. And as long as a unique sequence is latched on to whatever your feature of interest is, we can capture that. So instead of do, performing, for example, um, this is very popular with folks that are immunologists who are who want to look at hundreds of proteins at a time. So what you can do is now you have this antibody-based assay that has feature barcode. So you have an an uh, NGS output, not just for your gene expression information, but also for your cell surface protein. So it makes things a lot easier and quicker than, for example, doing a flow experiment where you would have to perform multiple different rounds or different iterations just uh, so you're not getting into that spectral overlap. And why might uh, looking at multiple modalities be important? And this is just a proof of concept and, and an example to show how having multiple levels of analytes and information from a cell can be very helpful. So for example, in this particular um, paper, this is again, just looking at different populations of PBMCs. And if you look at something like CD11C, so we're looking at the mRNA expression in blue and the antibody expression in green, th these two have pretty good correlation. So things make sense that there's mRNA expression, there's protein expression, but then there's also cases where if you look at CD56, the mRNA expression is what we call it called salt and pepper. It's, a, it's little sparse, it's hard to, hard to keep track of, but when you look at the antibody expression, you can see in which particular cell clusters um, the protein is expressed. So in cases where there might not be a concordance between mRNA expression and the protein expression, be because the mRNA is not as stable or there's you know one copy of mRNA producing multiple copies of protein. In cases like that, having these um, different types of information coming from the same cell definitely, definitely um, helps a lot there. And again, as a quick review of how we can apply this feature barcode technology, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of people in immunology have used these technologies where, for example, if you're interested in B cells or T cells, you can stain your cells with antibody of interest, as well as if you have particular antigens and you want to know which cells are um, interacting or capturing these antigens, you can stain them together. And after flow cytometry, so now you can get gene expression information as well as clonotype information. So paired BDJ, BCR or TCR information, your antigen specificity information. So which of these paired um, clonotypes are also recognizing a certain antigen specific um, T cell as well as cell surface protein information. So four different kinds of information coming from the same cell. And as I quickly mentioned earlier, we also have cloud analysis that's available to you to accelerate your data analysis. So previously people used to have to at least get on a Linux command line and be able to execute one or two commands to be able to analyze their data. But now what you can do is as long as, as soon as you have your FASTQ files, you can upload it to our 10X cloud and you can do all your analysis on the 10X cloud as well. And the nice thing about the 10X cloud is compared to our older um, style and method of performing data analysis, it's about four times faster and it, it's, it's, very, it's very convenient, it's very easy. I'm not a bioinformatician myself, but I've ran through a few data analysis um, instances on the cloud myself and it makes things very, very easy for people who also might not have the bioinformatics um, experience, expertise or, or that, um, bioinformatics um, capability available to you as well. So the cloud analysis does all of the analysis as in the alignment and QC and that, and we have what we call our loop browser, which lets you visualize all your data. So you can visualize your data either based on gene expression level, protein experiment, uh, experiment uh, protein expression level. If you have different experimental conditions, you can compare different experimental conditions. So test versus um, control, et cetera, all of those can be visualized with our loop browser as well. 
So after that quick technology review, I want to show you two or three examples of how people have used these 10x solutions to answer what kinds of questions. And I will say a lot of these solutions, usually if you go on, you know, even our support page and look at publications, a lot of these are um, a little skewed toward human and mouse. So what I've tried to do is come up with a few examples that are not human and mouse, just to show that these technologies can be very easily adaptable to other, other kinds of species and answer different kinds of um, questions as well. So to start off with, I'll start with the single cell transcriptomic analysis of Alzheimer's disease. So this was performed in about 50 different in individuals, half of them were male, half of them were female. And the idea really here for this particular publication was to profile the single nucleus transcriptome from the prefrontal cortex in patients that had varying degrees of Alzheimer's disease pathology. And the goal really was to set up a first blueprint to interrogate the molecular underpinnings and the cellular basis of Alzheimer's disease. So when they took these nuclei from these different uh, people and ran it through the 10X single nuclei RNA-seq solution, they were able to identify all these transcriptionally distinct subpopulations that across six major brain cell types that we can see in the T-SNE plot here. And what they were able to find is that the strongest Alzheimer disease associated changes really appeared early on in the pathological progression and were highly cell type specific and the genes that they saw tend to upregulate it in late stage were common and they were, they were common across all the different cell types that they saw. And these uh, genes that were upregulated in the late stage were primarily involved in global stress response. So similarly, such kind of research has also been done to answer the question of aging. And in this case, it's in um, Drosophila. So the goal here was to comprehensively generate a single cell transcriptomic atlas of the entire adult Drosophila brain. And so what they did was the researcher samples across uh, the brain across at the lifespan of the Drosophila. So there is eight different time points. So zero, one, three, and six days and nine, 15, 30, and 50. So a little juvenile versus um, adult brain. And what they were able to do is so dissect the brains at different uh, time point and per, run it through the 10X single uh, cell RNA sequencing solution and combine the data together to see what kind of changes you might see. So primarily, of course, this is the first um, cell atlas of aging brain that has been established in Drosophila. And when they performed unsupervised clustering and trajectory analysis, what they saw was all the different types of cells that you see in the brains, a little younger brain versus adult brains, there's not a lot of changes in the different cell types and components that are there. So we know that during aging, the RNA content does decline exponentially, but it seems that even if the RNA content is declining, it's really not affecting any of the identity, the different cell type identity um, in the older brains. It, there does seem to be a little bit of change in the glial population from the younger to the older brain. But what we saw, what they saw was there was still, even if there's RNA decline, the identity of the different cell types was not what is being, um, be, being changed here. So the conclusion drawn is that the, the aging mechanisms are cell type specific, and there is a certain types of cells that can show a clear aging trajectory in their transcriptional profile. But a lot of that is also at the different cell types remain even in, in older, older brains. Um, this is an example of looking at different, um, the metabolism and reproduction of plants. And we know that when it comes to metabolism and re reproduction, there's a division of labor among the different cells, but at least in plants with previously all bulk analysis being done, researchers knew that these different cells had various functions, but because everything was being performed in bulk, they were not really sure which cells were applicable to which parts of the pathways and what was going on. So here they applied the single cell RNA sequencing to the aerial part of rice seedling. So we're looking at rice here and grew it in various environments. So the different environments that they talk about is high salinity and low salinity as well, uh, high salinity and low nitrogen. 
So primarily, again, the first is, of course, developing and establishing a cell atlas because no one had performed single cell RNA sequencing on rice plants and seedlings before. But what they were able to find is there are five different major cell types that show up in this particular um, publication. And you can see between the control, high salinity, and low nitrogen, these five types of cell types are present in all the different kinds of environments that the rice seedlings were looked at. And what's really interesting is so when you look at the seedling samples of control and low nitrogen and high salinity, they all, of course, have all five cell types. And the interesting thing is, so for example, if you look at something like the mesophyll cells that are shown in red here in this bar plot, the cells that uh, the genes that were upregulated in low nitrogen in this particular cell type were found to be cells that were that would respond in oxidative stress. And if you look at the cells that were downregulated in the same cell type, so the mesophyll, so the downregulated in nitrogen, these cells, uh, these genes were enriched in oxidoreductase activity. So they showed that there's intrinsic coupling between oxidative as well as ammonium metabolism in mesophyll cells. And it might be a little confusing if you're not going back and forth, but you will see the colors between the two different cell type, the different cell types between the two bar charts is the same. So they, they're, um, they're arranged based on going from the size of the upregulation of gene going forward down. So we can see that there's heterogeneity within how these different types of cells respond to either high salinity as well as no nitrogen. So there's a lot of heterogeneity when it comes to response by, by these cells. And I also wanted to quickly put this little quote up here. This comes from a publication where they were looking at um, coral and, and into some symbiosis with algae, very interesting publication, where they had a specific concern. They knew some of the cells in the coral were responsible for endosymbiosis, but they didn't know which particular cells. So it was really great to see how this in this publication, they were able to specify which particular cells from the coral are engaged in endosymbiosis. So one of the um, sentences for the publication says that bulk sequencing, even if it you're performing it in populations of cells, brings many caveats of interpretation, which likely shift upon testing with single cell RNA-seq and double fish. And again, this is just to say, when we're looking at data in bulk, it's kind of hard to say which cells might be responsible for what, but, you, but when you have that granularity with single cell sequencing, you can start making, making some of these um, distinctions that you were previously not able to. And I wanted to quickly touch on one other assay before um, I move on to Vizium and pass it on to Jenny, and that's the single cell ATAC seq assay. So we know there's um, interplay between epigenetic programs and gene expression. So of course, you have to have open chromatin region and transcription factors binding, as well as RNA polymerase complexes binding to be able to have a productive transcription. And then that translates into protein. So there are certain things that regulate the epigenome. So having a, a, an understanding of how these chromatin regions are regulated or if a chromatin region is open or closed and being able to relay that information with a gene expression is very important. And one of the popular methods, which first came out in 2013 is called ATAXI. So assay for transposes um, accessible chromatin. And what this particular assay does is you incubate your um, chromatin, your nuclei with transposes. So wherever there is accessible chromatin, the transposes goes in and drops uh, sequencing adapters on here. So if you has clo have closed chromatin because the chromatin is not accessible, you're not going to see those segments, but wherever you have accessibility, now those show up as peaks when you uh, perform next generation sequencing. And the nice thing about attack seek is you can get a lot of different types of information from the same, same experiment. For example, Back when I was in graduate school too, we used to do a lot of chip seeks against, and we did a lot of transcription factors. So you were performing so many different kinds of immunoprecipitates to get 
these different NGS outputs, sequence them, and then lay them together to get a comprehensive view of what's going on. But the nice thing about a seek is because you're capturing all these different open regions and signatures, now you can start finding promoter peaks, enhancer peaks, CTCF boundary elements peaks. So all of this information can come from the same experiment and it doesn't even have to be protein dependent or antibody dependent. So we've also enabled a tax seek with, uh, this is one of our single cell solutions. So instead of starting with whole cells, you will start with nuclei that have been transposed and now you're capturing a transposed nuclei with a different set of barcoded gel beads. So the idea here doesn't really change about how you're generating that single cell information. Um, the input is just what's different, the input as well as the different bar barcoded gel beads that you use. And I wanted to use that as a prelude to this example here. So it's, you know, a lot of people use single cell RNA sequencing, but a tax seek is also another method of performing these experiments and learning what's going on in the particular sample. You can pick a tax seek for different reasons. One could be because you're interested in understanding gene regulatory network. The other could be your sample type is a little tricky to work with. So there could be uh, when you're working with plants, it could be there's some protoplasts that you're worried with. So if you could just isolate nuclei and work with those, the data is a lot more clear. So this uh, example is where the group isolated nuclei using fluorescence activated nuclei sorting or fans and generated single cell accessibility profile in um, uh, different um, parts of maize. So previously, not a lot of work had been done at single cell level with maize to begin with. And what they were able to find from this publication by looking at the single chromatin accessibility in this maze is that when they look and analyze the different genetic variation maze, they, it showed that there's lower polymorphism rate within cell type specific um, this uh, chromatin accessible regions. And this was previously not known. So this publication was able to further that understanding as well. And lastly, one of the other methods that can be applied is if you're interested in both the uh, genetic, uh, the epigenetic or genetic regulation, gene regulatory network, as well as the output, which is the mRNA expression, you can, you can perform experiments that give you both information at the same time. And this is what we call our multiomassay. So the multiomassay, again, the input is going to be transposed nuclei but we have re-engineered the gel bead so you can get single cell gene expression as well as chromatin accessibility information, not just from the same sample, but from the same cell. And this also previously people used to take their sample divided into two, perform two separate assays, which also meant you needed twice as much the starting amount of sample. But if you have very limited sample, you're able to get both of these kinds of information from the, from the same sample as well. And lastly, in terms of sample consideration, so Sam, the most important part of a successful single cell experiment that I tell everybody is your sample. So you have to make your make sure your sample is of high quality. And I do want to mention, you know, even if um, some of the examples I showed to you might not be something you work with, um, you can go to our publications page. There, these Artenic solutions have been used in a variety of different kinds of species. So if you're interested in something in particular, you can always check out the publication page to get specific um, information on how the sample preparation was up. But one of the first things, of course, you have to decide on when you're trying to perform these experiments is what are you measuring? Are you interested in protein? Are you interested in chromatin? Are you interested in a combination of a few of those? And then based on that, it's easy to decide if your input should be whole cells, whole cells or nuclei or nuclei. And we also have a lot of support available and starting materials available to get sample prep optimized. Because like I said, um, we have to make sure sample prep is of good quality before you go in. And if anybody has any questions regarding uh, sample prep in specific, I can of course take those questions at the end and offline as well. And before I pass it on to Jenny, I know she has very exciting um, data to share with Visium. I did want to give a quick primer on what the Visium spatial technology is. So everybody kind of has an idea about what this technology does. 
So like uh, Liz and Robbie mentioned earlier, this is thinking about it like almost the next step after you do single cell technologies. So Visium technology brings whole transcriptome analysis with a tissue context. So for example, we're looking at here um, a human breast ductal carcinoma in situ. And when you have a whole transcriptome of this particular tissue as well, you can layer that information. So this is all, of course, molecular information on top of the histological or pathological information. And now we can start looking at molecular changes within these uh, tissue sections. The way the Visium spatial gene expression solution works is in terms of sample prep, you'll take your tissue slices and pl place them on what we call these small capture areas. And then you can image it, you can do morphological um, H&E staining for morphological context or IF for immunofluorescence for protein code detection. And after that, uh, from here on, it's pretty much standard molecular biology where you perform barcoding and construct a library that again gets sequenced on Illumina sequencer and we have tools to help you analyze and visualize your data. And the way the spatial barcoding is done is almost like thinking about how that single cell RNA seq for single cell is transported onto Visium. So what happens is within these capture areas, we have barcoded spots. So when you lay your tissue on these barcoded spots and each of these spots have, of course, like unique spatial barcode based on where the molecular um, cDNA was captured, which barcode was captured, we can overlay that information back onto this capture area and also overlay the image information from the tissue. So we're combining those two kinds of information together. So that's my primer for Visium. I did want to put this up. If you have any questions about the promo, you can let, reach out to Liz. But if um, you order any single cell reactions by December 31st in 2021, there is promos available for the first and second order that come in. So um, Liz's and Ivy's emails are listed on this on this slide. And like I said, Ravi already has the chromium controller available. So it's a matter of um, getting the reagents that would be applicable to your research and then performing, performing the appropriate um, sample optimization. So from here, I'll pass it on to Jenny. I'm very excited to hear what she has to share about the Visium solution as well. And if you have any questions, this is the local team that a uh, local 10x team that supports U UMass Amherst as well. So I will pass this on to Jenny and stop my share. Okay. All right, thanks, Rasha. All right, thanks, Rasha. And thanks, um, Robbie and Lisa and Andrew for having me here to talk to you guys a little bit about my experience. Uh, uh, with the 10 x Visium technology. Um, and so the first thing I want to tell you is this, uh, I'm a new faculty here uh, at UMass Amherst. I started my lab in the biochemistry molecular biology department in January of this year. Uh, so the work that I'm going to be discussing today is actually work that I completed in my postdoctoral training uh, at UC Santa Barbara in Ken Cossack's group. Um, but uh, I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about um, the work uh, and we're hoping to continue this work uh, in my laboratory here as well. Uh, and so this is going to be looking uh, using the 10X Visium technology uh, to look at uh, tau spread. Um, and so if I can click. Uh, so tau, in our lab, we're really focused on this protein called tau or the microtubule associated protein tau. Uh, it's a protein that binds and stabilizes microtubules um, and this process uh, is known to be regulated by phosphorylation. Uh, but tau is most infamous for its role in disease, uh, such as Alzheimer's disease or other frontal temporal dementias. Um, and what we know about tau in disease context is that it has the ability um, to aggregate. And so tau can form these uh, high ordered species, oligomers uh, and fibrils. Uh, and these are the uh, predominant pathology that we see uh, in patients, for example, with frontal temporal, frontal temporal dementia, which is what I'm showing you here, is tau aggregates. Um, but another really interesting phenomenon that's true to all tauopathies is that this tau aggregation uh, cascade happens in a sequential pattern. Um, so for example, in Alzheimer's disease, we have BRAC staging to look at different stages of the pathology. 
Um, and what we know is that tau aggregation begins in the entorhinal cortex and then spreads in a predictable manner throughout the brain. Um, and this allows the actual staging of the pathology. And so this has always been a really interesting uh, phenomenon. And in my postdoctoral work, I uh, took on this sort of question to try to answer uh, how is tau aggregates spreading throughout the brain? Uh, can we sort of decipher the molecular mechanisms that underlie this? Um, and to kind of cut a really long story very short, uh, we discovered this uh, receptor uh, called LRP1, uh, which is critical for the spread of tau protein. Uh, we could show that in cells, if you knock down LRP1 using CRISPR, uh, you no longer get uptake of tau into cells. We could show that this was true for neurons. And so on the left panel, I'm showing you wild type IPS uh, human derived neurons. Uh, and if we knock down LRP1 in these cells, we no longer see tau uh, spread, which is shown here by the green dots. We went on to show that this was also true in, a, in an organism. So in mice, we use this clever um, AAV system where we take a mouse and in, inject an AAV that it encodes for a GFP protein followed by a P2A sequence. This is a sequence that self uh, uh, stalls on the ribosome and causes a cleavage event followed by a human tau protein sequence. And so we can take this AAV and inject it into a mouse. And the really uh, beauty of the system is that the GFP allows us to mark donor cells. So they'll be GFP positive as cells that were got the virus. Um, but we know that tau protein is able to spread throughout the brain. And so we can then use uh, classic immunofluorescence to look for human tau protein in the brain uh, and mark our recipient cells as human tau positive GFP negative cells. Uh, and so we did this experiment uh, in wild type mice, uh, either with a PBS injection or mice that were harboring a scramble shRNA or an shRNA targeting our receptor LRP1. Uh, and what we could see is I'll just direct you to the bottom panel here. Uh, is that in white here is our tau spread after injection. Um, if we have a scramble, we see lots of spread of our tau protein. Um, but if we have our, our receptor knocked down, we no longer get the spread outside of our uh, initial injection site. Uh, and that's just quantified here on the right for you. Um, but really, uh, what I want to talk to you about was sort of the next steps after this work. This was very exciting. Um, but really what I got excited about after doing these experiments for a few years was this never really, this always seemed to amaze me is the amount of spread that we saw with a simple injection uh, in mice. And so here's just another image of it here where I'm showing you our GFP injection. So this is where the, the virus was injected. Um, and in red, I'm showing you uh, the, the tau staining, right? And so this was always crazy to me that we were seeing so much spread uh, in a wild type animal. And uh, the beauty of this model uh, was that it was an AAV based model. So it allowed us a lot of flexibility so we could easily change the virus that we we're induce, introducing into the animals. And it made me start to think that we could ask some pretty exciting questions. Um, especially I went to a 10X seminar similar to this one uh, and I heard them talking about the Visium technology and I got pretty excited because we had a really nice visual way to look at tau spread. Uh, and it started to make me think that we could combine our immunofluorescence imaging uh, with something as powerful as uh, single cell sequencing technology. Uh, and it got even more exciting about this because we had known that when we do these tau spread, we do really nice uh, staining images. We could see that tau spread wasn't just transneuronal. Uh, we could see that tau spread was spreading to cells that were in the left image. I'm showing you cells that are nu n negative, so they are not neurons. And in the right image, I'm showing you tau spread again in red. And these are SOX2 positive cells, uh, uh, which label astrocytes. And so on top of the fact that we were seeing this sort of spread phenomenon, and while we, we think it's mostly neuronal, we knew that there were other cell types within the brain that were likely playing a role. Uh, and so um, I came up with the idea that we should try doing this Visium technology to kind of get at these questions of asking, what are the transcriptional profiles that uh, happen when we see tau spread in the mouse brain? Um, how does the cellular identity influence this? Neurons versus astrocytes um, or microglia? Um, well, how does the age, like I said, this is an AAV based system. And so we can easily change lots of parameters such as the age of the animal um, or the presence uh, of mutations. Uh, so the first experiment actually that we did 
uh, was looking at injections that incorporated either a wild type human tau protein or a disease uh, relevant mutant that causes a frontal temporal dementia, which is a P301L tau mutant. Uh, and we did this um, across four different animal ages um, as sort of a pilot experiment with this technology. Um, and I guess I don't really have to go through this because uh, Russia just talked to you about it, um, but really briefly, uh, it's actually very simple to do, um, especially if you already have your imaging protocols set up um, where you just take a slice of your tissue. Um, in our case, we were using a, um, a cryostat to do 10 micron slices uh, onto their capture slides that you purchase from uh, 10X Genomics. Uh, then you stain your tissues and image it. And this is the caveat where I tell you that I got maybe a little too early on the Visium train um, <laughs> because they recently <laughs> released uh, FFPE slides, uh, compatible, compatible slides. Uh, at the time when I was doing these experiments, uh, I was told that we could only use fresh frozen samples, uh, which anyone who's ever done immunofluorescence with a fresh frozen tissue sample knows. Uh, I will apologize for the images from here on out because they are rough. Um, and that was just because we had to um, use fresh frozen samples as opposed to fixed samples, which now they have the chemistry worked out so that can be done. Uh, and I'm excited about potentially <laughs> doing more experiments with the uh, FFPE slide compatible ones. Um, once you do that though, uh, the tissue, you, you image it, you permeabilize it on the slide to release the RNA and it's captured, like Russia said, at the spatially area with the barcoded probes um, and you can easily fit um, uh, a whole a whole half of a mouse brain um, in this section. It doesn't take up the whole thing even. Cool. So what does the data look like? So this is honestly the data um, just right after processing, going through. I will say that 10x Genomics has a fantastic software package um, for people who are not bioinformatic bioinformaticians, um, make it really easy as sort of a plug and play uh, simplistic thing that you can do. On the left, I'm showing you um, an immunofluorescence image from one of our samples. And so uh, uh, in green is GFP. And so this is the part where you can see that the imaging quality is not as great as the ones I was showing you before. Um, but in red, you can see where we see our where we're seeing tau spread um, outside of our injection site. And then this is what the automated pipeline from 10X Genomics does, uh, basically looking at the individual barcoded spots and the transcriptome underneath them, uh, and then uh, doing uh, uh, nearest neighbors and unbiased clustering uh, to kind of show you uh, what sort of populations you have there. Um, I had a graduate student who started with me in April, uh, and I asked, I tasked him with doing this bioinformatics product, which was basically integrating all of our data sets. Uh, and so he used the Surat package uh, in R to do an integration across um, uh, animal age. So like I mentioned, we had different ages, two, four, six, and eight month old animals where we did this experiment. Uh, he was able to take all of this um, uh, single spot transcriptome data and integrate it into each other. And um, I, I was really excited about um, uh, someone, again, he is not a bioinformatician either. So just kind of show you that uh, this sort of pipeline is possible. Um, uh, Surat is a package uh, that has lots of tutorials on the web uh, and is pretty easy to uh, move forward with. He was able to uh, take, Andrew took, uh, took these samples and was able to delineate from our immunofluorescence images uh, spots that were injection spots versus spots that were spread spots. Uh, and we could start to look at how the clustering of these um, spots were different based on their identity. Uh, he was able to do differential gene expression analysis, looking at our spread cells versus non-spread cells. Um, and really excitingly, he was able to use uh, some uh, cutting edge algorithms that other people have developed in the single cell space, uh, particularly this is called Spotlight. And, and so the way that this works is it basically uses known single cell RNA-seq data sets uh, and uses that to deconvolute uh, the spatial spots uh, in our images. And so as you can imagine, uh, a spot on this slide is not a single cell. So I, I try not to say this is single cell sequencing uh, because it's single spot sequencing. Um, but the nice thing is that there's a proportion of cells underneath that spot. And so by using known single cell RNA sequencing data sets, they can deconvolute uh, the proportions of cells underneath those spots based on known markers for different um, cell types. 
And so uh, doing that, you can get this really cool data. So each of the spots now is actually like a little pie chart. I hope you can, yeah, you can definitely see that. Um, where uh, each, each spot now can kind of give you the proportion of the cell types underneath it. Um, and one thing that he found, I don't think I, maybe for the sake of time, I took it out, um, was that he saw a proportion, uh, a higher proportion of microglia uh, in our spread cells uh, than in our non-spread cells. And so um, moving forward, Andrew's really excited uh, to be looking at microglia in our spread uh, cell types. And we're hoping to do uh, more of these types of analyses uh, moving forward. And so that's all I had to say, it was really quick. Uh, like I mentioned, Andrew, uh, was an MCB student. He's an MCB student here. He's in my lab. Um, and I'm sure if you have any questions on any of the bioinformatics he did, he'd be happy to help. Um, this work uh, was supported by my postdoctoral mentor, Ken Kosick at UCSB, um, as well as uh, Morgan in his lab. And that's all I had. So I could take any questions that anyone might have um, regarding that. Thanks, Jenny. I welcome anyone to mute yourself and ask your question to Jenny or to Rosha or to Ravi. I think it's just so much information, everybody doesn't want to ask any questions. <laughs> uh, maybe I can start it. Uh, I can start the question here. Uh, so, you know, one of the things we are concerned about is the overall cost of the project. Maybe, you know, Rosha or Liz can you know, comment on this. Uh, for a single cell project, the cost per sample. Uh, one thought you know, we had while discussing with Liz was to do the load throughput. So we can get you know, some of the users at least, you know, um, expand about the single cell project. Uh, so maybe Liz or Rosha can fill this question. Uh, how should we go about it? Or what are the merits or, you know, the merits of the cost versus data? Because the cost comes around, maybe, you know, um, Close to seven hundred dollars per sample and low throughput chip. So maybe you can comment on that and uh, helpful for the uh, projects. I can go first. I can comment on the pros and cons with the low throughput versus the standard kit, and I'll talk. I'll let Liz comment on the cost. So the low throughput kit in my mind is a great kit if you're trying to optimize your sample prep because sometimes. If people are very new to 10X and they're working with sample types, it's tricky to optimize. They might think, oh, like, you know, I have everything nailed down, but sometimes people will run it through the standard kit and turns out the sample prep needs further optimization. And unfortunately, there's really no way to know if your single cell experiment worked really well until after you sequence it, because most of the QC we do is um, kind of qualitative, you're doing it at a bulk level. So you do have to even do some sort of shallow sequencing to see if the single cell sequencing works. The low throughput kit has a lot reduced unique barcodes. So the RNA-seq uh, example, product example that I showed you has about 3.5 million unique 10X barcodes in those gel beads. The low throughput kit has only about 9,000. And the maximum capture cell number for a low throughput kit is about a thousand cells versus for the standard kit, you could go anywhere from 500 cells to up to 10,000 cells. So between having the low diversity of um, gel beads and much lower cell capture, the data actually is not as robust as the standard kit. So, um, you know, if you're optimizing your sample prep, you need to do something real quick to generate at least some preliminary data to put it in a grand application to show that you can do single cell. I think the low throughput kit fits there, but if you really need to dig deeper into the biology, I think the standard kit um, is a much better option. And I think Liz can talk about how we can go about helping with the cost so you can still perform these experiments. Yeah, I think Rosh is correct. You know, the low throughput kit has some great advantages. Um, the one thing I'll really um, recommend is if you're considering using one versus the other or really any project, we have a field application scientist, Stephen, who isn't on the call today, but similar to Rosha, you know, uh, he does a lot of the hands-on um, work in, in kind of preparing projects so he can really walk through everything with you. 
and he can give kind of the best guidance about whether the low th throughput or whether our standard kit would be the best. Again, it's great for for sample optimization, um, you know, and and I think there could be a lot of instances at UMass where that might be necessary. You know, like Patricia said, we're more mammalian um, sample and and mouse samples, and you know, it's just we don't have some of these um, as much experience maybe when some of a plant and other applications. Uh, but we definitely don't want to, you know, it can cut the cost down um, for sure on your per sample cost. But what we don't want to happen is for you to run the assay and then realize you actually, in order to get enough data for a publication, really do need to actually run a, a full assay with, uh, you know, 8,000 or 10,000 cells. Um, so that's kind of what we don't want to, you know, it's, it's an only, you know, $700 a sample to run the low throughput kit. But that's not useful if you then have to go and buy another kit and run the full experiment. So it's just something that, you know, we just ask that you, we are totally open having a conversation with you and we can kind of give you the best guidance and, and our best um, opinion on that. Uh, and like Rosha said, we do, you know, offer, um, you know, they've got the promotion right now for 15% off for the first person who wants to pull the trigger and, and order through UMass. Um, we can always work with you on pricing. And um, so don't, you know, uh, I'd like to sit down and have a conversation about the experiment first and what you really need before you you instantly think it's too expensive to use. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other questions, we're getting after the um, three o'clock time. So I just like to thank Rosha and Jenny and Liz and Ravi and thank you all for attending today's seminar. Our next seminar is next Tuesday, September 21st. It'll be Sleep Monitoring Lab with Professor Rebecca Spencer. And the title of her talk is Assessing Sleep Physiology and Function. I hope to see you all there. Goodbye, everyone. Have a good day.